Um, so today, I really just want to share what is going on within Microsoft, what the challenges we're facing. Of course, we're hiring. So, and I told all the students, you know, it's just fantastic to be in the field of speech and language. And Microsoft has over 200 to 300 people working in this area. If you look at the broadly AI, speech and language, and the vision all included, deep learning, we have 5,000 people working on AI as a company. So we usually have 10%, uh, you know, new, new people we're hiring because all the older people, they are leaving. Like Jeff is right, as you know, went to the financial industry. Lee Den went to the financial industry. So the market is very hot. It's, uh, it's fantastic to be working on speech and language. So in this talk, I have one hour, right? And uh, I, I will share some of the exciting things in AI as a whole. And two years ago, Microsoft Research invented this bestnet. That just did amazing thing for computer vision. It's so deep, I cannot even put you know, the whole network structure on the slide. It's 150 layers of basic neural nets. The most powerful thing is with this, you know, bypassing. So you have network, it's that deep, this just you know, give you the connection to actually touch and to, to reach the bottom. Also really focus on improve the learning efficiency. And when I talked to Jane Song and Kai Ming, who actually invented this ResNet, I just felt terrible. Because in 1991, I did you know, something similar. But I told the students today, actually I dynamic grab this one, just to actually share with you. When you're working on your PhD thesis, absolutely go extra mile. I didn't go extra mile. That's why this was a dead project. And this was a paper I published in 91. And this is the network. I have, yeah, I have the connection. I didn't stack enough to, do, to finish the work. Of course, at that time, at the CMU, had a sound free workstation. I wrote the, everything myself. There was no TensorFlow or CNTK available. Um, but you have to be lucky to go extra mile with computing and data. So the good news is we did go extra mile. We con continued pushing hard on the switchboard in the last 25 years. So this is really a collective effort from, from you know, many, many people. Um, I, want, I want to talk a little bit about this one. But before that, I want to share with a short video so you, are, you know, you'll be convinced how excited you are, how lucky you are working on AI. Okay? Let's test the audio, see if this is working well. Are working? Those are real projects that are changing people's lives. This is a real company that is reducing emission. This is a famous Swedish company on tooling. India organization on the food production and this is the drone to check the power security 
you think? Isn't that fantastic? You know, working on AI, speech and language, of course, is the core of the core for AI. So I want to share this, the economist. There was a in the first issue of that really summarized a fantastic journey starting in 1950. IBM started in machine translation research in 1954. And of course, I wasn't even born at that time. And there was a famous John critical article from Bell Labs on speech. That was probably the pre-winter of AI. And most recently, we had uh, you know Google, Siri, and the Microsoft's uh, human parity milestone. This really highlighted some of the fascinating milestone and the persistence, perseverance that all of us did demonstrate in our journey to reach excellence and the driving advanced science and uh, speech and the language. And if you have not, please just read this article. I, I found this article to be fascinating, summarizing the journey all of us should be proud of. If you want to go one level deep, deeper, we summarize some of the papers published on the switchboard task. I know switchboard is something you guys are all familiar with, but the, this is also good to see this normal distribution. Most of the system, they have the error rate around the, slightly under 10%, 9 to 10%. And uh, they are also innovative approaches coming up every year or so. Usually, they're in the range of 15% or above because they're new. They're not finely tuned. And IBM and Microsoft have, have been leading the pack in creating the absolute the best system. And it's around 5%, 5 to 6%. So if you feed this data to the commercial production system, regardless whether it's Google or Microsoft, they are in the range of 15 to 20%. So I want to really highlight the point the best technology, even though we reach the human parity on the switchboard, if you actually use this data for a general purpose domain, the error rate will still go up to over 20%. So cross domain is the unsolved problem. Um, three years ago, Raji Reddy, Jim Baker, article for ACM Communications trying to really summarize what happened over the last 40 years. The reason was that Roger Reddy had the 1975 speech tutorial published in IEEE proceedings. We thought that actually 40 years passed, <coughs> we should have just read that one. So we wrote this together. That reflected the three chains of people because both Jim Baker and I worked on the CMU with Roger Reddy. And you know Jim was the founder of Dragon System, he did his PhD with Raj using the Marco model and before system. This field. <coughs> does this article talk about things that the system does better than humans and things it does worse? I assume that if, the, if on average it gets the same word hour rate as humans, it must be better in some ways and worse than others. <coughs> and we didn't actually talk about the human parity at that time. This one, the point I want to actually talk about this paper was the, f the field is advanced so fast, is already sort of obsolete with this tutorial. OK, that's my, my key point. It is amazing. That's how, how amazing it is to be in this field. So there are three kinds of neural nets that really give us the weapon, the feed forward neural nets convolution neural nets and the recurrent neural nets. And by combining those three things together, magic could happen. That's essentially what the most people are using today. Of course, you can use those three types of neural nets to augment other traditional machine learning systems, such as transfer learning, reinforcement learning. But those are orthogonal to deep learning itself. So deep learning, I wanted to really highlight really give us 
tremendous progress on the perception-related AI. Like the example I cited on computer vision, image net, speech recognition on the switchboard, is well-defined. You map from one sequence of data to another sequence. Speech recognition is well-defined. Wave to word. Image net, the same thing. So for perception-related AI, we have made a tremendous progress as a society, thanks to deep learning. But for cognition-related one, we are way off, still. And the AI is popular. People, you know, most people, probably they do not differentiate between cognition and the perception-related challenges. Um, for cognition work, you have to have knowledge. You want to have knowledge, you have to have common sense. You have to have the ability to comprehend language. That's how you accumulate the knowledge, right? In order to really accumulate knowledge, you have to have language capability. And the language capability, you want to do that well, you have to have knowledge. It's hard for anyone to understand organic chemistry without having the knowledge. You can go to a college classroom. You even have the basic language capability, but you probably not understand organic chemistry. So human beings, we are able to really, you know, accumulate the knowledge using the language capability in an intertwined way. But for computer system, this is the biggest problem for AI. We need the knowledge to understand the language, and we need language understanding capability to accumulate and acquire knowledge. Until this problem is solved, cognition problem is not going to be really taking off, in my humble view. So for AI, perception related thing through deep learning, thanks to these three kinds of neural nets, we have made a tremendous progress together. But for cognition, you have to solve the knowledge acquisition and the general language understanding together then that will be the real dream coming true for AI. Back to the deep learning narrow field. And it's really simple. Three kinds of neural nets with back propagation. Um, the paradigm shift is really actually, this is also to, to some degree hitting traditional computer vision people and speech people pretty hard. Because you know now with an open open deep learning toolkit, you get data, you define the objective function. Most of the work is actually about the parameter tuning. You don't need to understand anything, and the feature representation combination, all the weight will be just tuned with data. And for computer vision people, the traditional feature extraction like shift-based technology, no longer necessary. You just feed the raw data using deep learning, you can get something amazing. And for speech recognition, also something similar. You do not need the PRP anymore. You feed the raw FFT, you can actually just even do the sequence to sequence. You can get something reasonable. So I don't know what to actually to say about this. To a large extent, most of the work is on parameter tuning. You have to be lucky. You have to have enough computing power. And uh, you have to have the sense of what to do. So deep learning gives us actually something amazing, as I said. It's uh, really good at uh, combining different features together. If you want to have a noise robust system, no problem. Augment your feature with a noise vector. And throw that into the system. You can train. Deep learning will combine those different things together in a very powerful way, and you have this in the system. Do you know why it works well? You don't know. And even for beamforming, you can have beamforming in the cloud using neural nets. And uh, I would not be surprised. Beamforming will be all, you know, performing well with combined speech recognition and, the, and the single processing through this agenda optimization. 
On the speaker independent system, it's very similar. You throw advocacy into the system, you create something even actually more powerful than traditional speaker independent model. It's a feature that can be regulated, I'm sure, together with all the weights in your speech recognition system, give you a tremendous performance improvement. So regardless whether it's a speaker specific feature, environment feature, or any other feature you can think of, the feature representation learning in combination with the rest of the system is just amazing. This is something very unique that in all the conditional, uh, conventional Gaussian mix, mixture model um, in the 90s. This is a day and the night. So <clears throat> Microsoft, um, we decided to actually really take advantage of deep learning, all the progress we have. We focus on working with switch, switchboard. We just want to see how far we can go. On the human parity, this was really the historical you know, review on the switchboard, what kind of performance people can actually make. Richard Lieberman from MIT Lincoln Lab claimed that you know, human parity was probably around 4%. But that was never validated. And I don't know if you, you, know, you, you are here long enough to know whether Richard Lieberman did anything to validate uh, uh, his claim. Yeah. Of course, that data is also old. So because of that old data, we, we just didn't, didn't know. We used the, the latest dev set that the, the community used. And but the second one was validated. I remember that there was a DARPA issue mm -hmm. that in the, in the transcriber error was on this, on this right. level. So that was a good estimate yep. how good how good people are. Right, those, you know, number one, number two, they were old data set. So on the latest data set, we decided we want to use Microsoft Professional Transcriber. So, see, I can guess what happened in 97, although I don't know it. It's very likely that what missed did is they wanted to get a sense of Peter's labor agreement. So they probably used the 97 eval set. And in addition to the LDC transcripts, mm -hmm. maybe Lippmann had a second transcriber transcribe one or two conversations. Or maybe mm -hmm. he did it himself, I don't mm -hmm. know what was that. And then they just compared it, came up with this 4% number. Mm -hmm. But because it was part of an evaluation set, they did not release that data to the whole community because you don't want to mm -hmm. pollute the science too much because people would continue using that test right. for other things. I'm guessing that's what must have happened. You can ask somebody at NIST to see the data. So we, yeah, we talked to, to a number of people. We're trying to find out that the. Yeah. Uh, but the similar experiment was done, I believe, in the end. I mean, yes. in the DARPA, the evaluation thing, so, and they claim that it's unreasonable to go below that because right. BBN's answer was 8 or 9%. No, 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 no. Well, fine. Just, uh, exactly. So, so those are on all the data set anyway. Uh -huh. So we tested on the new, new, relatively newer evaluation set, and uh, this was a, our professional transcription team. Because we transcribe our incoming data continuously, so we did feed the dev set and uh, the test set without telling them we're doing this one, just like a regular, you know, Microsoft speech labeling trans transcription services. And we got two teams working on this one. We found the performance was around 5.9, and IBM challenged that 5.9. They, they thought they can go lower, so on the same data set. They had four teams working together in Australia, and roughly 20 times real time, less than multiple times, they claimed they lowered the error rate to 5.1. But the 5.1 or 5.9, you know, that's uh, not the point. The point is really people, you and me, most likely is going to be 6%. And uh, if you go extremely careful with four teams working together, you can probably reach 5.1. But I do not know if that is uh, accurate or not, because that the correct transcription itself is debatable. Yeah, I can tell you my personal experience. I've actually transcribed switchboard in Cosmo mm -hmm. And I've come in at about 15 to 20%. <laughs> Even after listening to it many times, I'm thinking, yeah. OK, this is my right. best transcript. I can't do it. Right. And uh, so we actually did this. Uh, I, I think I, I want to go come here first. So we and I cast 
this year, we ask every attendees, I don't know how many of you did try this one. With, with Microsoft speech system and the human label, we want, wanted people to pick after listening to the original. The result was uh, impressive, 50-50. Nobody can tell the difference between machine-recognized label versus human label. So it's fair to say that human parity is actually pretty well achieved on the domain. Yes? Sorry, can you say how the experiment was set up in the last one? This one? Yeah. And that cast, we, ha we play the audio. We have two labels. We ask you to say which one is machine generated, which one is human. So the label is a transcript of the entire sentence? Yes. It's 50-50. Huh? Speech was not. No, I, I did it. Yeah, OK, OK. So yeah, that, without. So you cannot make this the same conclusion as the previous one. Because the speech was not provided. The only guess was based on a transcript. OK. When I did the experiment in Tunisia, I thought, I thought, yeah, OK. I, I, didn't, I didn't test the ICASP side. Why didn't they actually provide a speech at the same time? OK. All right. So. The third, the third bullet point is the first. Yeah. Yes. I was just going to say, even if they provided the, the speech, it seems like you're testing not exactly parity with humans in identifying the speech. But in, I mean, you're, you're getting their model of what of a what, uh, speech recognition system might do. I, the question seems a little bit odd, but you're asking them to determine which is by human versus machine rather than which is correct or something. I don't know. But when I, when I test this one, basically to me, as you know, my personal view is really, it's uh, hard to distinguish those two transcription, even if you actually listen to the audio. Yeah, but you're, you're asking people to judge between human and machine rather than to try to transcribe it themselves. I, I don't know. It seems like what you want to measure is that transcription versus so what, what the, the, the whole point was IBM claims that we have not reached human parity unless you are 5.1. I just want to make the point. When we measured the human parity on the switchboard data set, it was 5.9. That was based on two teams of Microsoft professional transcriber. Was, uh, you know, our system was 5.8 at that time. Of course, you ha we can go lower, but it makes, doesn't make a lot of sense to go lower because we know, you know beating this Further, doesn't make a you know a lot of sense because the even the transcription of humans, what is the correct one? Why do we think that the correct label is correct? Because we're debating on that issue right now at this stage. If you like to listen to the the audio, you you can see you know R and R, which one is R and R? You know hesitation, all those things. These are all in those areas, mostly. In this BBM DARPA test. Interesting. They play. They show two transcriptions by two different transcribers, and then they play the acoustics, and everybody agreed that neither of these two was correct. <laughs> because everybody has different words. So providing the speech is actually yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that, that's a good point. The, the point I'm, I'm making is really if you have a domain specific yeah. task, if computational resources are not a, a, a concern. Using 10 neural nets working together, you can say that's crazy, but you can reach a human parity. That's, my, that, that's, the, that's the claim Microsoft had. And the, working with the whole community, we achieved that together. It's a, that's the claim on the switchboard task, we reach a human parity. And this was how exactly what we did. I'm sure you, know, you, you, can, you can check that cast paper. It's a combination of uh, three neural nets working together. And Engineering miracle. This, we don't know why this worked well, and uh, it's not interpretable because just we combined three broad class of neural nets. They're working in parallel. Um, actually, you can make this even real time, good enough, because everything is done in the cloud. You can you can have everything running in parallel and put them together in a powerful way, close to real time. Yes. So 
So before the full system combination was around the six percent, I think, and six to six, seven percent. If you look at the, the absolute best model, let's see. Without the without the LSTM, let's say we take an NGRAM model. The BLSTM, the best one was around the 8.3. Using RNN language model, the best one was 6.9. So with a combination, we reached the 5.8. So the best model was actually 8 to 9% in that range. But you have to use some sort of language model, right? Without the language model at all? I don't think we tried it without the language model at all. Without Ingram. Yeah. It's just curious and I'm like, just to see what you're saying. So Ingram is the, the, probably the worst language model in, in, in the experiment here. So if I may come and do the third language model, you mean all words are equally. Yeah, Unigram. You get about 28% when you start. We didn't try that. Uh, yeah, okay. So the three kinds of neural nets, they really created different kinds of errors. And the, you, by combining them, you, you, you can get something amazing. I, I didn't believe we could have achieved the human parity. And this was, uh, you know, as, 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 as I said, when I started working on speech in 82, I could have never imagined, you know, speech recognition could reach that level. Switchboard, of course, is hard. That, has been worked on for over 20 years. Which was used for the first time in the Rutgers University workshop, summer workshop, 86% error. Yeah. Right. That was, wh which year was that? 80, 90, 92? Yeah. Yeah, 80%. So we should all congratulate to ourselves for what we have done, right? The persistence, you know really did pay off. So, um, I want to actually share a little bit more story why Microsoft is interested in doing speech. Um, of course, we have the personal digital assistant, Cortana. That's in Windows 10. I, I don't see many Windows 10 devices here. Most of them are Mac. It's too bad. <laughs> And we also have, yeah, we also have a Harman Kardon speaker coming out very soon. This is a Cortana speaker. If you are using Windows 10, your personal profile, everything is uh, is the same. So you can say, "Hey, Cortana," without opening your eyes, you, know, you can still be in the bed, find out the latest news about the Johns Hopkins University. And uh, what's even cool is really. Skype is integrated into this device. You can say, hey, call Sanjeev. And you have a very powerful hands-free speakerphone in the kitchen. So musical quality with Harman is just fantastic. The speaker quality is just amazing. I really enjoyed two things for this one. I don't need to really ask about what time is it, you know, because I, there are many clocks at home. So I'm dog footing this one. The, the two things that I really change my life is the music. You can have any music better than Pandora because you know you still have to you know be passive. Here you want to say the Phantom of Opera for the moment, then Phantom of Opera will be played. And you want to communicate with anyone, call mom, call dad. Uh, you can be in the kitchen washing your stuff, washing dish, you can chat. And and the personalized news too. You can say New, tell me news about the John Hopkins University. The Bing search will actually group, ag, ag, you know, aggregated the news about the John Hopkins. Will tell you the story about the John Hopkins. So, the ability to free yourself, always on, and uh, accurate respond to your voice is just uh, amazing. So, public offering offers on the first party basis, but I want really tell you a few things how we are trying to help third party to democratize AI and to take advantage of what we have. So Microsoft's view is really intelligent and cloud intelligent edge. Today, because of the cloud and the multiple devices all working together, AI is playing a very, very important role. 
even more important than what AI was 10 years ago. Um, there are three things all of you know, big compute, big data, and AI. When you have those three coming together, really AI is in the center of the universe. So you guys are, all the students are working on speech and language, you are really, really lucky. And we wanted to really help the whole community moving forward. Microsoft packaged everything together. This was um, Project Oxford. We always use City as the code name. Now, after two years working on this, we have close to 30 APIs together. On the speech front, you have a customer speech. As I said, you know, cross-domain is very challenging. So general purpose recognition is just not good enough. That's why we provide that tool. You can actually provide your own language data, text data, speech data, and we can create any point just for your own domain. This is very powerful. Essentially, we democratize the speech secret sauce. You don't need to use anything. You don't need to use CNTK or Cauti. Just give me the data, send it to Microsoft Cloud. Microsoft will use GPU to customize create an endpoint, that's a state of the art, production ready. Oh, this slide only projected half of the stuff. And I want to share with you one video, Project Prague. I know Hanek is actually happy. We named the uh, after the capital of Czech, but we didn't do it for you, okay? It was just in the one names we loved. And uh, let me share, share with you the video. This is the gesture recognition engine. That is very powerful. I'll stop here. Now you can see Project Prague will actually give you the ability to manipulate and uh, without touching the device. Combined with speech, this is the next wave in my personal opinion. Speech is very good to bring information that is, that's complex together, but it's very bad to manipulate object. But just look at the power. Use Intel RealSense camera. You can manipulate as if you're touching the device. <clears throat> so the underlying technology is also exciting. In computer vision today, most of the gesture stuff it's very much like a template-based dynamic time warping, if you're old enough to know what it is. And even today, most of computer vision gesture recognition is template-based. Template yes? In what you just showed us in the demo, what is the sensing device, the camera? Is it just a single camera? On the Intel rear sense. The it's from Intel rear sense depth camera. Oh, it does have depth? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we, we can recognize articulated the hand, finger. You, you need a depth camera to do that. But the, the point is, you know, a lot of people use camera to do gesture, like including Xbox Connect. They are in the, if you map them into the, to the speech community, they are DTW based. Every gesture is a template. For the first time, Microsoft created a vocabulary or dictionary for gesture. <clears throat> you can define pose, finger, a movement. You can create a, a dictionary, like a phonetic pronunciation for each word, for every gesture. So for the first time, we created a, a dictionary based gesture recognition. You can customize gesture for anything you want by creating this pronunciation of gesture movement.
pulse movement direction and the finger. So this was done using that technology. That will actually great give us the flexibility you need. The problem for gesture is really, you don't know what the gestures people want. And <clears throat> if you train a gesture on the basic stuff, you can support like four or five gestures. So this is unlimited gesture capability if you're application developers. <clears throat> I'm, mostly I'm mostly excited with this one because combined with voice, this will free people from being tethered to the device. You know, we, ha we have seen enough trained. IBM mainframe dominated computing. PC, desktop, free the people from going to the mainframe computer room, punch the card, that created a revolution. iPhone did the same thing to PC. iPhone free the people from sitting in front of the desktop, they move the you know, computing to the pocket of every individual. But you still have to you know, hold the device, touch, you are still being tethered to the device. So the next big wave, in my view, is similar to what Amazon Echo, Echo did. That will free people from touching the device. No matter where you are, you can say, hey, Kutana, OK, Google. Get the things done. But that's not, not only half of the story. With a gesture and the speech combined, this is going to really change the next paradigm shift. So it's an exciting time. And the underlying technology is all similar, based on deep learning. It's a perception based. And with deep learning, open source toolkit, you can get many things done in a more powerful way. So I want to actually show you another video about the customer speech services. It's called Crystal AI. It's part of Microsoft Cognitive Services. This is a game company. And they used the Chris to really deliver something amazing. That wasn't you know, hard to imagine just a few years ago. So this is the power of customization because you know this company is a startup with a public of 15 people working on gaming. They never can afford to have like 200 people working on speech customized for their own needs. But with Microsoft customer speech service, they uploaded their data, customized the vocabulary, very much like you and me, you know, just so we can recreate this whole speech engine, adapt to the new domain and have amazing performance. That's based on the same engine we're using for Cortana. So actually, I want to just do a live demo for the fun, because I, I, I think we have a little bit of time. Using custom speech service, I want to do a live presentation here. I want to share with you. This is actually related to speech translation. You can see probably I have a PowerPoint. Right? This is PowerPoint. I just want to tell you, you guys are you, on Mac, I'm sorry, we don't offer that feature. But if you're using Windows 10 with Microsoft 365, on the slide they show, did you see there's a start of subtitling? OK. I put my name here. So what language I want to speak? You can speak as many as you want. I can only speak English here. And uh, <clears throat> I think I want a close talk microphone. But this is, let me plug in the close talk microphone for the demo.
slide, slide. That's my head side. Now I can translate everything into English, English to English, or other languages. And then I can do a live subtitling service. If you have a Microsoft Translator, you can install this on your mobile devices and join the conversation with the code here. And uh, you can have my subtitled closed captioning on your device in your own language. So this is a PowerPoint add-on. If I give a talk, I can afford to buy or bring a very expensive closed captionist to the classroom. And if you don't actually speak English, no problem. Join the conversation. We support up to 60 languages. So even with my Scottish English accent, with Chinese touch, is kind of transcribing reasonably OK, right? Of course, everything was powered by CNTK. What do you think? I don't know. This is actually amazing technology coming to the classroom. Um, the real story is that Cambridge University and the Peking University had their joint program. And students from Peking University, when they arrived in Cambridge, they can read English very well. But the, in the classroom, they can probably only understand half of what was said. Just like me, when I was in Scotland, my god. What, what, where am I? Where did I learn my English? I wish I could just, you know, and that, that wasn't the time I could have the professor having a subtitling or closed captioning in the classroom. So I wish I had that luxury. Then I would probably have performed better on speech recognition because just I wasn't a good student because I couldn't understand half of what was said. So. That inspired us to really enable every classroom, lecture room, with these services. So when you actually have the PowerPoint, language model is adapted dynamically. So all those weird names such as CNTK can be recognized. And my accent is also adapted on the fly. So everything is customized. Accuracy is reasonable, probably Every rate is on the 10%, even with my Chinese Scottish accent. So that's the service coming very soon. Yeah, it's public. Would you be willing to demo the translation? Huh? Would you be willing to demo the translation? Of course, yes. That's, how many have you installed the Microsoft Translator? Just install. Let's do. Let's go to the website. Let me, let me do a real live demo. Well, I, I meant with the PowerPoint add-on, but if you want to do the other way, PowerPoint part is the same thing. But let's do the v because this one is not. It will be out very soon, and but too bad if most of you guys are on Mac. Oh, good. So go to Microsoft. You know, go to translator.microsoft.com. You can start a conversation. Let's say I start a conversation here. We can support up to 100 people chatting using 60 languages at the same time. So I can start a conversation. That will show up the code. If you install the Microsoft Translator, you can join the conversation with this code, EJLHA, or scan. So let me turn on the TTS. I have, I have my, my iPhone. I will launch the Microsoft trans, uh, Translator, join the conversation, type in the word E J L H A. Okay, I joined. I'm going to talk in Chinese. How many have you joined? Use your devices. I'm very happy to be here to the Dong Hai An.
I just said in Chinese, if you understand Chinese, I say, I'm very happy to come to this course. You can try other languages. Other languages. You want to try other languages? Any language? You have to use the Microsoft Translate to join the conversation, and then we can chat online up to 60 languages with 100 people. We, yeah, speech will support 20, text will support 60. Okay, so this is the, the, the system we have. So for the same reason, when you present your PowerPoint, you have a subtitling. The, so, the same subtitling <coughs> will be trans translated into up to 60 languages on your mobile devices. Then you can save this to your OneNote, or you don't need to worry about, you know, busy taking notes in the classroom. That's we are just you know amazing productivity gain we can get to help people. Okay? Nobody's chatting. I, I see one, two, three, four join the conversation. Use your own language, you know, type or, or try anything. Someone's typing. Okay, we uh, we don't have much time left. Hello. Someone said hello. <laughs> Was that right, French? Yeah, yeah. I don't speak French, so uh, someone typed in French. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. I will, I will shut down this so you don't have the chance to talk anything anymore. So this was the real story of what the Microsoft internally is using. So we had the, our um, build conference. The CEO was speaking. And then in every building, there's a big screen. And uh, everything is being transcribed. And let me sh share the video. I just, I, and this was in building 99. Um, I just used my mobile devices. So the CEO was speaking. Everything was being transcribed like what I was using. And uh, on the PC, I actually joined the conversation. I was reading in Chinese of the CEO, CEO's speech. You can see this one has a code here. It's not clear. So this is being used daily in every lecture room and Microsoft. So people might be wondering on the translation, what is the quality? You know. It's Google this, Google that. It's all Google neural translation, fantastic. Yeah, it is fantastic. In comparison to statistical machine translation, Google made a tremendous progress. So we just did the benchmark with human between Microsoft Translator and the Google Translator on Chinese, English pair. As you can see, the higher the better on the, on the quality. And Microsoft is blue, Google is orange. Google was clearly a little bit better on the statistical translation quality. When Google and Microsoft ship neural translation at the same time, actually literally at the same time, and Google got other PR, fantastic. But no, nobody noticed Microsoft also shipped the neural translation at the same time. Actually, the person who managed that was uh, the classmate of Sanjeev Arun in IIT. He, he's, he's in my team now. And uh, to my surprise, actually, blue was a little bit higher on the quality when we evaluated between Chinese and English, as you can see on this chart. I cannot judge other languages, so we didn't measure. We only measured Chinese and English. So machine translation is similar to speech recognition. You have extremely well-defined framework, one language to another language pair. 
So with LSTM attention model, multiple layer, you can create the magic. It's, uh, it's, it's very good, but it's not good enough to claim we'll, we are reaching human parity yet. But I hope in the next two years, human parity between Chinese and English can be achieved. And that, that's why it's, it, it's a very exciting time. So another case I would do is really Microsoft Custom Support. So Custom Support is a really huge business. If you look at the worldwide customer support cost, is over 300 billion US dollars annual spending. So all the companies combined on the customer support cost is 300 billion. Um, Microsoft is not an exception. So we have a huge amount of support. We use the deep learning, deep reinforcement learning to support. So when you come to support, there's a you know, contact us option. In the past, when you hit contact us, you hit in you know, a live support agent. But today, Microsoft AI is really helping the front line to really answer your technical question. So does any of you have any Microsoft support question on the product related, how to upgrade Windows 10? Come up with someone, we'll do a live demo. Yes. Sanjeev, you are you are the professor. I want to actually you know <laughs> give that the privilege to the the person who raised the hand. That's like, we don't actually answer future product related thing. It's a past, but let's try anyway. When is speech right? It will be confused. There's no chat capability. How do I turn on slide numbering and PowerPoint? Let me start over because this one has memory. What's your question? How do I turn on slide numbering? How 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 to turn on slide numbering in PowerPoint? Slide slide numbers in PowerPoint. Is that the right one? So that give you the answer. And this is simple. One shot, we can give you the answer. If it's complicated, we have actual dialogue. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is true. Since you're library, I would, I would have expected it to say click on file. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, we can absolutely do better. And we only cover the 30% of top questions. You have actually more intelligent interaction. And for the tail one, we actually we can pinpoint to the right answer. Much better than a typical search engine. We, we, we did the internal benchmark. So let me just share with you um, how to reset password. So you can see this is the typical dialogue with a little bit of intelligence because it is a top query 
people don't know what to do when they forgot the password. So they will ask you what kind of account you have. And so you have the engaging dialogue. So it's a local account, a Microsoft account, or you don't know. It's a Microsoft account, so you have actually a specific answer on how to reset the Microsoft account, you see? Step by step, got it. If you're not happy, no, let's say I'm not happy. Then we'll bring live agent. You can talk to a live person. You will not be actually left you know, without the, the support and help. This is actually a you know, very powerful business application that will enable any organization to be more productive. So I really actually, in my introduction, I said cognition is a tough problem. This is a natural language understanding with conversation context. It's a hard problem, but it's a narrow domain. But this domain is not narrow. If you think about the Microsoft product support, it's one of the most difficult, most challenging customer support tasks in the whole industry. I can tell you that. Because of the, um, you know, we have Windows, Azure, Server, Exchange, Office, broad set of product, require very deep technical people to support. So the cost of support is not, hey, how do I return this thing I purchased yesterday? It's, uh, it's you know, very expensive. And we are able to really mine that structured, unstructured data and the structured data together, provide this agent that actually can help typical simple questions. For the deep one, we still need the humans working together with AI. So that is the key point I'm making. The AI today is, has reached the point that it can solve simple questions. That, but the simple question is actually very frequent. It's going to hit the, you know, any organization in a big way. We can save a lot of time for the agent. So they can deal with more complicated questions in a more powerful way. In the end, customers are happier. So that's another example. I have left. The real story was, you know, 80% of Microsoft AI workloads were powered by CMTK. I want to share that story with you. For the industrial production ready AI, for some internal jobs are running on CTK, on GPU. And we share this toolkit with the public through the open source. It's on GitHub. And the most powerful feature is, is it. And Hong Kong Baptist University, what workload? CM, ResNet, connected the simple neural nets. And they also have on the hardware CPU based, GPU based. The real bright spot for NTK is multi GPU support on distributed learning. But they, they didn't really talk to us about that, whether we should benchmark that. They only benchmarked on a single GPU. Let's take LSTM as an example, because this is important, very important class. On the number here, Probably is hard to read, but yourself on archive, okay? <coughs> the speed. <coughs> you can see the LSTM yet, so that they didn't benchmark. CNTK is 0 0.01. This is the speed. The smaller, the better. The lag fastest is 0 0.065, about six times lower, which is TensorFlow? Oh, that's impressive. MX that is actually a little bit slower than TensorFlow. I don't know why. Um, at the point, uh, I talked to a lot of students. They all told me the quota is that one for the biggest challenge on the GPU usage. If you use CNTK, you have six times the quota you have. So you see your call. So Hong Kong University did that benchmark. That's only academic on the smaller domain. In the GTC conference from Emedia this year, the CEO gave a, a talk. I just did the screenshot. Of, of course, CAFE has a new version, CAFE 2. And those two are the similar training workloads. And this one is LSTM. I don't think the CEO of Emedia was trying to really tell the public 
the benchmark which one is faster. He wants everyone to use the, their GPU. The, the key point that he made was between Pascal and the Volta, you can see huge improvement. This is really just amazing. The new Volta GPU is much faster than Tencent TPU2. But GPU is about, about one third or two thirds of the, the performance of V series. So his point was really, if you have Pascal GPU, I guess, you know, you can see what kind of speed up you can have. You can have. I know your, your GPU is still in the K series, right? K, K40? Yeah, K series. So M series is about twice as fast as K series. P series is about twice as fast as M series. And the V series is the new, newest one they, they're coming out. That's just amazing. This company is how fast they move. They really just, uh, you know, have the, the speed every year. It's like Intel. You have to upgrade. You know, look at the speed, right? So because I'm from Microsoft, I want to use this slide, not from me. This is from the CEO of NVIDIA. And he only benchmark on the three fastest toolkit on the latest Volta GPU. So I think MXNet, this is MXNet, Microsoft CNTK, and the Cafe 2 are the three fastest in, in the workloads. And also the smaller the bar, the faster. Those two are comparable. You can see on the latest fastest, which one is the, the, the lowest. So once again, if quota is a concern, you guys should just go to download CNTK the, uh, I will skip this one. So 2.0 is coming out just in a few days. We'll actually finish everything. We'll be in GitHub. And this is a, you know, have completed Python API. The extensibility is just amazing. Really, it was designed to give you the ability to extend and tutor tutorial example, everything is actually polished. So it also has the Java support, model compression, and uh, you can use Keras front end with CNTK. So I'm not going to say more about the benefits. This is my talk. Uh, I, I just want to end up here. The AI is just amazing. Cognition still remains challenging. But the perception related work is uh, phenomenal. We are here to really help each of you, every organization, to be more productive. That's our mission. And on this journey, I'm, I'm sure we can actually have tremendous opportunity working together. Thank you. Today's talk, it is a little bit like, oh, we are there. But I know you well enough that I think you know about some edges where it still sucks. And it's good for the students yeah. to hear what do you think they should be working on. That, that, that's a good, good question, actually. I, as I said, you know, we reached the human parity on the switchboard. We never said we reached the human parity on speech recognition. Mm -hmm. So it's not a solved problem. That's number one. <clears throat> number two, I really feel that there are a number of huge, big issues we have to deal with. The noise of robustness is one from on the far field. Even on the simple task to recognize speech and the non-speech with far field open microphone is an unsolved problem. What is your F1 score on this you know, two class classification problem? It's not unsolved. And cross domain, 
we have the custom speech service. Yes, you need to still feed the data to the system. Without data, you cannot really adapt. So how you can really effectively support 300 languages? Like in India alone, there are 300 languages spoken. And you don't have many you know, speech data you can rely on. So how can you support all the languages spoken? That's a huge challenge. And probably the most important is the context, the cognition related. Without the context, without the understanding, you just cannot do well on speech recognition. You cannot do well on translation. You cannot do well on TTS. Right now, we're doing reasonably OK because deep learning memorized all the data as if we are able to really do a good job. So cognition is the, probably the biggest challenge. And the noise robustness, far field, the microphone, and uh, cross domain. Those are probably three biggest related to people who can speak your language. So it's not absolutely solved problem. That's why we're interested in coming here, really telling you we are hiring, so please get yourself ready. And by the time you graduate, consider us. And we all, of course, we want to collaborate and make a speech integrated into many vertical domains, from customer support to medical applications. Just it's a tremendous opportunity for all of us. Yes. <clears throat> That, that, that's a good question. The cognitive services gesture is really more, nothing more than um, a toolkit to enable you to do whatever you want. So we created this engine that's very powerful for you to customize, to create your own application with your own gesture. So how you want to use that one is up to you. But you can apply this gesture with other modality this way. Hunch is that gesture and voice computer vision combined will free people from being tethered to the devices. So invisible computing finally is possible. This is the powerful wave that we have to write on. And the Microsoft Cognitive Services provided a basic function for developers to really create that together with speech services and the vision services face. So we have 30 API that will help people make revolution possible. You could be one, you could be the next Steve Jobs. So that should have, you know, each of you next paradigm shift. Oh, you know, ourselves. And I have seen the power of PC, right? the power of mobile. What is the next wave? Invisible computing, ambient computing. That is coming. That's very clear. And you know, up to you to stitch the
So, on the switchboard, we use up to 2,000 hours of speech standard. That's the maximum data we can have. And on the production system, we use far more than that. But the, that is only for US English. We have not seen the end of it. The more data you add, as long as you have enough GPU, the better it's getting. But the voice is probably good enough to have a basic system up and running. Even if you have less than that, it's still OK. But the challenge is really, for the small languages, what is you can have without having that luxury? Even 300 hours is too much. We have 20 languages for speech, TTS. And the translation will have 60 languages. 60. 60. 60, yeah. But the for speech translation, we have 20. Yeah. But the, we, we, we spend a lot of time worrying about the Chinese English, because those two are broadly spoken. Right? So the quality is not the same. If you compare English or Chinese to, like I say, Thai language translation, I don't think they will be on par with English and Chinese translation quality. So they're not, all the language pair, if you look at these metrics, they're not identical. Okay, thank you.